Hi, everybody. This is Steve Simpson from the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm the uh, Director of Legal Studies here, and with me is Ankar Gatte, Senior Fellow and uh, Chief Content Officer. Ankar? Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, uh, so we're, we're uh, here to do a video for New Ideal, and essentially the, the broad topic here is free speech. And uh, so what I want to do is, uh, is just introduce, set a little bit of context, but we're going to talk about an article that uh, we've both read recently that's uh, made the rounds, at least on my Facebook feed from the New York Times, uh, that is a really interesting article written by a uh, philosophy professor about the subject of free speech, but I'll get into that in a minute. But let me just set up the context a little bit first. As everybody, I think, who's not living in a cave knows, there's a big debate in America and, frankly, uh, in many Western countries about free speech, what it means, whether what censorship means, whether the government is, is imposing on free speech and, and whether other people are as well. Um, uh, a lot of the discussion about this has focused on, I would say, two, two areas, really. One is college campuses, because there's all kinds of disputes on college campuses today about offensive speech about what sort of speakers college campuses should allow on campus uh, and that whether or not when a college campus, say, or an administration doesn't allow somebody to speak, whether that's a violation of somebody's right to free speech. So there's a big debate about the nature of free speech, I would put it, on college campus. More recently, we've seen that same kind of debate um, uh, come up around, I would put it as social media, although I think media in general, but uh, the, 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 the specific example that I'm thinking about um, or, or, or the, the phenomenon is people criticizing social media, Facebook and YouTube are the big ones, for allegedly censoring people's views um, and for uh, restricting, allegedly restricting conservative views typically. Um, and a lot of people equate this with censorship. So there's a big debate about this. And we have a very different view of, of that issue, which we'll bring out um, in the course of the discussion. But um, a lot of what I'm seeing uh, in response to this argument that, say, college uh, uh, campuses should allow all speakers and that that's an issue of free speech if they don't, um, is uh, there's kind of a pushback that I've seen from a lot of academics um, and others and other intellectuals making the argument that it's not a violation of anybody's free speech of a college. Um, often I think it's whether it's public or private, although we can discuss that, uh, but certainly in the context of a private university, not allowing certain people to express their views on campus, that's not a violation of anybody's right to free speech. I haven't seen people coming to the defense of Facebook as much as they, they should, although we have done that, uh, in saying that if Facebook restricts somebody's free speech or restricts speech on their platform, that's not a violation of anybody's right to free speech. And these articles and these arguments are interesting. They're, they, they raise some good points. They make a lot of mistakes, and what we want to do today is talk about one in particular that I alluded to uh, a moment ago, which was uh, published by the New York Times um, in June, so June 25th, 2018, and the, the, the title of the article is The Ignorant Do Not Have a Right to an Audience, and it's written by a philosophy professor um, by the name of Brian Van Norden. He teaches at uh, Yale and Vassar, among uh, other places. And uh, his article, as I said, is very interesting. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, as the title suggests, um, I mean, his position that the ignorant do not have a right to an audience, I would put it as no one has a right to an audience, although we can bring out what he means by that. But he makes some really interesting points. And one of the points he makes is that we have to make a distinction between the idea of censoring someone's speech um, which is something, although he doesn't really put it this way, it's something that only government can do, and, and not giving somebody an audience or a platform from which to speak, which is not the same thing as censorship. Um, and that's a good point that he makes. He makes a lot of wrong-headed points in the article, and I'll summarize it in a minute. One of the reasons I think it's, it's interesting, or actually two reasons I think this article is interesting. One is, if we as supporters of free speech really want to convince people to be in favor of free speech, we have to and be able to answer arguments such as the arguments that, that this guy is making, that this philosopher is making. Um, another uh, reason that it's interesting is, uh, at least as I said before, on my Facebook page, uh, I think a lot of people read what he's saying as embracing what I've heard people say or describe as a culture of censorship. 
which I don't quite think is right. I think there's many things wrong with his argument, and you could get to censorship if you followed a lot of the, the arguments he makes, but I don't think that's what people are reacting to. I think a lot of people do believe today, a lot of really you know, generally bright people, people who want to support free speech, that if colleges say, or Facebook or social media restricts what people can say, that that somehow threaten, threatens freedom of speech, which is really wrong-headed perspective. So, um, but Ankar, do you want to say anything before I summarize the article? Yeah, I'll just say one thing. So I think it's, it's um, you put it something like our view is that only the government can censor. So, the, and, and if you think about the First Amendment, it's directed against government. Government yeah. does not have the power. I think that's really important. And there's a way you can read the article, at, and we'll talk about this more after you summarize it, where it's, he's, try, he's making that distinction between what a government can and cannot do and what it should be prohibited from doing, right. and how to think about private institutions. But the article doesn't put it in those terms. No. So you could read it like that. But there's a way which you could read it as deliberately confusing that issue. Right. And so I could see someone who who's, thinks that this is, there, there's some, it's somehow um, casting doubt or muddying the waters about the nature yeah. of free speech, or someone reading and saying, yeah, this is an important distinction in thinking about free speech. You yep. can sort of take either from the article. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And I have to say, with the first time I read it, my, I read it very quickly. And I thought, oh, this guy's making some good points and people are attacking him for his good points. Then when I really read it closely, I thought, okay, it's way more mixed. Yeah. Um, and there are, it, it's true, you could, you could see him as, as uh, either mistakenly or deliberately muddying the waters. And I think, I would say deliberately in some ways, and, and we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, but one of the lessons to take away from this discussion ultimately is you really have to be clear, you, you have to, read things carefully to understand what people are saying. A quick read on Facebook is not the best way to do things, no matter what, you know, whether, I mean, you, you end up focusing on things out of context. Um, so uh, a clear reading or a careful reading of articles and arguments like this is, is really important if we want to understand free speech. Uh, but let me, within, without further ado, why don't I dive in and I'll just summarize the article. And I don't know if I said this already, um, but we'll link to the article in the notes to the video or, or on New Idea where we, we have the intro to this video. So um, viewers might want to just go read the article first and then come back and watch the video, but that's up to you. We'll, we'll summarize it. Uh, but it's definitely, um, uh, it, it's, it's worthwhile to read the entire article because it's a really interesting um, argument, I think, and, and just a good example of why a careful reading of, of arguments is absolutely essential. Um, all right, so let me summarize this. I'm going to do it relatively briefly and kind of hit it on a point-by-point -point basis. As we discuss it, more will come out. Um, as, as I said, this is not a substitute for reading the article. Um, but anyway, he starts off with, and I would put his, his, his opening point um, as uh, the popular view that listening to ignorant views um, uh, or all sides of an issue is actually wrong. And he starts, he introduces this by starting off with two examples. He uses Ann Coulter and, Char uh, and Jordan Peterson. It, the examples in, in themselves don't matter. We can discuss that. But his basic point is, essentially, people often make really stupid and ignorant, ignorant arguments. Um, and although there's this popular view that we should listen to all sides, he's challenging that popular view. And he thinks, in fact, that it's not necessarily a good thing um, to listen to all sides of an argument, or at least that we, should, we ought to uh, be skeptical and, and, uh, um, and not always support all sides. He, he attributes this view, this popular view, that uh, we ought to always listen to all sides, or that everybody has some value to contribute to a debate to John Stuart Mill. Um, so he takes Mill's um, argument to task. Ankar, I'm just going to sum summarize um, Mill's view very quickly, but if you want to jump in and, and add to that, um, I'm not by any means an expert uh, on Mill, but Mill's essential argument was that, um, that even if an argument is, so that there, you could think of it as um, all arguments can either be false, they can be partly true, or, uh, or they, they can be entirely true. And then in all events, we ought to pay attention to those arguments. If they're, if they're entirely true, 
and we dismiss them, then we're missing the truth that they that they have to offer. If they're partly true, we gain from debating with people about whether they're true or not. Um, and uh, and sort of as I think Mill puts it, as the clash of truth and falsity is a good way to learn. If they're false, we lose the ability to understand a false argument and uh, and in analyzing a false argument, uh, we can learn things even from false arguments. And I, I would put that as, I mean, this is not the author speaking here, but I think there's a lot of truth to what Mill is talking about, although it doesn't really get to the issue of freedom of speech versus censorship. It's more, I think, about how you should approach learning and, and understanding ideas. Um, but what, do you wanna, do you have something you wanna say about that or? Well, yeah, that that, I don't think his summary of Mill is completely accurate, yeah. but this last part is particularly important. I think somewhere in the piece, he puts it that Mill is defending almost an unconditional right, right. to free speech. And Mill's not defending the right to free speech, right. since he's not relying on abstract utility, yeah. an abstract right to, to, That's uh, right. To, to establish his argument. He's relying on the principle of utility, which is a very different principle um, so I wouldn't put it in the language of rights, and Mill doesn't. And what is also important, I think, in reading Mill, he's blending together, and I think this is a massive error, but he's blending together moral issues about when you would morally sanction or walk away, not sanction, say, I'm not going to deal with this person because of right. his control, and what government can yeah. and cannot do and can and cannot control. And Mill's putting all that together because he's just looking at it from the perspective of what is beneficial or harmful to society. <laughs> or you could put that in a little more utilitarian yeah. way, but that's his perspective. And from that perspective, it's not crucially important if government's doing it or the general population, like right. we're too unwilling sort of as a, as, a, as a society to entertain the free thinker, the person who questions our norm. He brings up Socrates and, uh, right. non-liberty and Socrates is questioning the foundations of a society and so on and there's he's talking about whether so Socrates obviously was put to death in the end for this so that's a political and government but it's also like what should the society's attitude be right. towards Socrates? should we shun him and Mill's putting all that together and I don't think yeah yeah and I would add to that that and I, but I want to get your perspective on this and again this is a digression from the article for a minute um, I think that's one of the big mistakes, one of the big errors that's happening in the debate about free speech today is conflating or failing to separate what our attitude should be toward other people who speak, both morally and I, maybe intellectually. That is, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about an icon on a college campus, it's, there's definite value in engaging false ideas and understanding false, and not just, I mean, I think it's crucial to learning. You really have to, if you don't really understand the mistakes that people make, um, you're not going to really fully understand what the truth is and have the kind of confidence in your own views that you need to have to really understand them. And I, my, my memory of Mill is that a, a lot of what he's saying seems to be that point, that, that if you really want to understand truth, you have to be willing to engage with falsity, although I might be wrong on Mill, but, but that's definitely, it's a virtue, I think, intellectually speaking, to engage with ideas, even false ideas, and to make sure you understand why they're false. But that's one aspect of this debate, which is not, it's not a free speech issue. It's an issue of, it's, it's how we deal with other people and their ideas morally and intellectually. But we have to separate that out from an issue of free speech as a right um, uh, with respect to, you know, in the context of our political freedom and what counts as censorship. And we miss, if, we, if we conflate those things, we get into a really bad situation where we, we end up, I think, inviting government to end up censoring, even if we think that we're trying to uh, you know, preserve free speech. Yeah, so the, there's three elements. There's the intellectual, there's the moral, and the political. Yeah. And yes, Mill is blending those three. And I think it's right to say that that, and it, it's, it's in part through the influence of On Liberty, that... It, that one in thinking about purportedly free speech issues, blending those three things together is that happens all the time. I think it happens in this piece yeah. and it happens in most people's thinking today, whether they're on the side or would say they're yeah. on the side of free speech or they want to limit it in some yeah. sense, they blend these issues together. And, and I don't think you can think 
clearly and correctly about it. Right. You blend those together. Yeah. All right, let me continue then um, uh, with summarizing the article. So basically, he's critical of the idea of Mill's approach to free speech. And one of the reasons that he criticizes it, it is that he says, he claims it's based on an enlightenment view of reason. Um, now, I'm not even sure if, if that's quite right, but you can speak to that if you if you want at some point, Ankar. But let me just get the basic point out that um, that the way, he, I forget exactly the way the author puts it. I think it's he puts it as, as um, it's based on a, a, a view that there is sort of an, what he describes as an ahistorical method of reason, by which I take him to mean that the that reason is an absolute or that reason is there is one method by which we come to know things, um, yeah. which is a definitely an enlightenment view, or at least I think it is, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's true. It also happens to be, or you know, we certainly believe it's true. <laughs> you know, it is true. It is true that reason functions in a particular way and that we can, through all time periods, um, uh, understand how reason works and, and arrive at the proper methodology. He attributes to this to Mill and Descartes, but there are other, certainly other Enlightenment philosophers than Descartes who believe this. Um, but what the, what the important point is, the author thinks this is wrong. Um, and the reason he thinks it's wrong, and this is a common argument, I think, it's really two things. It's people disagree about what reason is, and I can observe that there are a lot of unreasonable people out there. Therefore, there's, that reason is not an absolute. The methodology of reason or the fact of reason is not absolute because people disagree about what it is and because there are all kinds of stupid people who make mistakes. Do you think that's accurate take on what he's saying? Yeah, and it, it, I mean, here's one, uh, a quote from it. And he's, he's trying to get the million perspective. It is, so he, this is what he says, it's sort of as a kind of rhetorical question, though he goes on to address it. Quote, what harm is there in people hearing obvious falsehood and specious argumentation if any sane and minimally educated person can see through them? The problem, though, is that humans are not rational yeah. in the way Mill assumes. I wish it were self-evident to everyone that we should not discriminate against people based on their sexual orientation, but the current vice president of the United States does not agree. And then he gives a close quote. And he gives another example of that. So it's, yes, it's, there's no, um, he uses reason as ahistorical, and, but he puts it as universal. And that's the sense in which it's an absolute, there's a method that for a human being to engage in in order to reach knowledge. But that's naive. And one of the things he gives as evidence for that is, well, Mill and Descartes disagree about the nature of reason. Right. Um, and then it's, yeah, and then most people either don't or are unable to follow a rational method, even if there was a universe. Yeah. Yeah, so from there then he goes on to say that the result of the, so that even though there are some practical benefits of the million approach, and he cites to Mill's embrace of women's rights, and by the way, the article is heavily skewed toward the author's perspective of what is good and bad and what is true and false, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. It's this mm -hmm. notion that everything I believe is, is, the, the truth and and it's it's obvious like you don't really need a process of reasoning you just should agree with me um, but I mean we can I think at least you can take the guy's points and his argument I think you can separate that out uh, although and and still make his argument or some aspect of his argument but I find that interesting but maybe that's worth talking about yeah. uh, but in any event he um, so he says one of the consequences of the million perspective even though there are some practical benefits is that, and this is in, in modern times, uh, we get in, we get into a situation, the way I'll, I'll put it, the author doesn't really put it like this, um, but it's something like the, the fake news phenomenon. So we have, we have all kinds of, you know, ignorant stupidity, nonsense being peddled by the media and by institutions that, you know, that, uh, that mass communications and the institutions of even of higher learning, one might say, although I don't know if he puts it that way, but certainly he indicts the media for this, as holding out stupidity and truth on essentially offering it up as equivalent, making no distinctions between those things. Um, and, and then, and that's providing a platform for the ignorant and the stupid, and one might even say the evil, I think he, that's implicit in what he's saying, evil ideas. 
and, and, and offering no distinction between the two. Um, and now it's a little unclear whether his, I mean, I think part of his, his view, his critique of that is uh, that ultimately leads people, the million view, if you take the million view to be all ideas are equally valid or legitimate, um, and you don't make any distinction um, among the truth or the goodness of ideas, the falsity or, or the morality of ideas or immorality, um, that you end up giving a platform uh, to evil, ignorant ideas and in, a, in essence sanction them as, as proper or as within the realm of civilized discourse. Um, and that that, you know, that kind of, that promotes um, ignorance and that promotes stupidity and even can promote evil. Do you want me to, why don't I pause there and see if you have anything to offer that? Yeah, I would, I would say it's to get fully why he's bringing up Mill. Um, and then so when he gets to sort of his view, he starts it off by uh, quoting now. However, our situation is very different from that of Mill, close quote. Yeah. And so, so what's the difference? Yeah. So if you go back to what he, he was put it as Mill, so M Mill's view is about harm. So what harm do, does evil ideas do? Because they yeah. bring significant benefits, Mill thinks. Sorry, not evil, but fault, that, you, that you have to engage with things that you disagree with and that you might think are wrong and even evil. That it's important that that happen because it leads to people having a much clearer grasp of the truth right. um, and not, it not, it not being transformed into dogma. So you know the reasons for why you think what you think is true. You know the reasons for why what you think is wrong is wrong and what you think is evil is evil. And that that's important. It's a, and, and there's an element of truth, I think, to yeah. that perspective. I don't think it's fully true the way Mill articulates it. And, but so the flip side is what harm will the falsehoods and evil ideas do? Well, if people can reason about them and think about them, they won't be prey to them in the, in the way. And that's kind of the enlightenment right. optimistic view. Right. The people have reason, they can exercise it. And if they do, and if they're free to do it, They'll come to see what's right, and it won't get necessarily everything correct, and it's not automatic, but the process and the trend is towards grasping what's true. And that's what he's throwing doubt on and takes the sort of the current environment that people yeah. can't distinguish between right. what's true and what's not. So wrong and evil ideas can be a lot more influential and therefore yeah. harmful than you might think. Yeah. Or that a million might think. So right. no too optimistic. Um, uh, and then I think there's another element to it. So you can put it in terms of the fake news and the media, but there's a way I think which in which it's a stand in for capitalism. Yeah. Um, and that well, yeah. yeah, I mean and I mean, he definitely gets into that because when he talks about institutions. Yeah, and even the media. So it's not yeah. that the media sort of is bankrupt intellectually. It's the media, so quoting, the media are motivated primarily by getting the largest audience yeah. possible, close quote. And that's sort of getting to the view, well, they want to make profits, and yeah. we all know that's a corrupt motivation right. and for corrupt things. So there's, it's a wider uh, critique, I think, at least oh, yeah. implicitly, yeah. But let me, yeah, let me summarize the rest of it because that's an important point that I think we really want to focus on. But so he goes on then to say, so I mean, if his, his point then is that if we take the million perspective, we're going to fail to, to treat ignorant and evil ideas as ignorant and evil. Now, that's, I think that's the best reading of, of what he's saying, that, that we have to make a distinction between truth and falsity, good and bad, although I, that's probably giving him a little bit too much. But but going on from there, he then says the, 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 the answer is not to suppress those ideas, um, although it's, it's, I don't think he's really clear about who would be doing the suppressing, but, and he seems to be against violence. So he says, although I found this really interesting, and it's wrong to use violence against them, um, but the reasons he gives for that is it's impractical because all you end up doing is turning those people into martyrs. Now, he does say that it's immoral, but at one point he says it's immoral because the, the, the result would be a kind of terror tactics. It would be widespread terror, which is true. I mean, if the government really tried to stamp out 
false speech. It would have to go on a terror rampage. I mean, this, you, would, you would get what you get in communist countries or theocracies. They would have to start murdering people. It's the only way to stamp out any kind of thinking or ideas. So he's right about that. But at one point, he basically says, and we also don't want to turn these people into Mars, which, I mean, that's not entirely wrong. Like, you can see that in history. And, and that, that happened to, I think, Hitler and many of Hitler's, you know, uh, um, uh, allies in Nazi Germany, that when they end up being jailed, they, be, they came out and they were actually martyrs. But there's a better argument against uh, jailing people for their ideas than that we're going to end up turning into martyr, martyrs. That's, that's stated as he states it. It's a pretty pragmatic argument. But in any event, so, so we shouldn't suppress those ideas. We shouldn't use violence against them. Instead, and, and this is a quote, he says, we should distinguish between, quote, free speech and just access. Um, and then he goes on to talk about uh, the institutions that are the gatekeepers of, uh, as he puts it, the gatekeepers of you know, communications and mass communications like the media. And he says they have a fiduciary responsibility, um, I'm not quoting here, I'm summarizing, to only publish or promote true ideas or, or to publish or promote you know, what he would consider to be good ideas. Um, and that sponsoring ignorant ideas uh, isn't just admirable open-mindedness, but amounts to giving support to stupidity and you might even say evil, that it, that it basically supports evil ideas. And there, I mean, this is part of what I think there's grains of truth in, in what he's saying. You definitely have to make a distinction between free speech and you know, a person's ability to get an audience or uh, um, anybody else's decision to provide them with the means or mechanisms of free speech. So it's not a denial of your free speech if a university refuses to allow you to speak or if a broadcasting company or, or network refuses to take you on as a guest or give you a platform. And we have to make that distinction. Um, but the way he talks about that is interesting. Um, but let me just get to the, the sort of takeaway um, and I want to find this, there are two quotes that I think are, are particularly interesting. Um, so one is that he says there's a clear line, getting to the point we are talking about before, this is a quote, there's a clear line between censoring someone and refusing to provide them with institutional resources for disseminating their ideas. Now, this is one of the places where he's right, but it depends on how you read him. And I, I'll return to this because there definitely is a clear line between censoring somebody and refusing to provide them with resources. So if I don't provide somebody I disagree with with a platform, if we don't provide them with a platform, we don't invite them to Ocon, that's not a denial of their free speech. But notice the languages he uses, and refusing to provide them with, quote, institutional resources. What the hell does institutional resources mean? And that, I think, gets to your point about, uh, he's, he's both very fuzzy in who he's talking about, and there is a kind of, um, there's definitely an undercurrent of antipathy for capitalism, for private ownership of, of, of the, to the, quote, institutional resources he's talking about. So we definitely have to disentangle those things. Um, but he then talks about a couple examples of uh, one in particular of the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institute firing a biologist who admitted he was against evolution. He defends this practice. I don't know a whole lot about that. I'd heard about it. But in principle, just the basic idea of an institution that supports science firing somebody who's against um, evolution strikes me as completely sound and appropriate. If they, and I would, I would defend it um, from the standpoint of their institutional integrity. If this is a guy who's going to teach biology and they're, I mean, leaving aside whether it's a public institution or a private institution, assuming a private institution, it's, it's, entirely defensible and probably virtuous for somebody to kick somebody out um, if they disagree with a fundamental tenet of the, of the institution. Um, so he takes that as, a, as, a, as an example of something good that we ought to do. That, that I take, one way you could take this as we have to judge the truth or falsity of ideas and decide with whom we're going to deal in the realm of ideal, ideas. Um, and that's, that's a large part of what he, the, the point he makes at the end. Um, I just want to read one more quote from, from the article. Um, that's the, the last sentence in the article. Quote, the invincibly ignorant and the intellectual husker, uh, huckster have every right to express their opinions, but their right to free speech is not the right to an audience. This, I think, is definitely true. Um, this, this, if you take that statement as stated, it's definitely true that um, 
that you know, stupid people have a right to express their views, but they have no right to an audience or right to be provided with the means of speaking by other people. That's part. That's what I was reacting to when I said I reacted to uh, to this positively. That he's making good points, and at the very least, they're points that that those who want to support free speech have to grapple with. But as I said, there's a lot packed in there. So let me pause and let you uh, offer some thoughts on some of this. Yeah, I think it's it's so you have to get the context of what's being argued and. It can be, and in this case, I think it's unclear exactly what the, uh, the context is. So the right to free speech is not the right to an audience. Yeah, um, yeah we, we will use that kind of formulation. Um, Ayn Rand used that kind of formulation. That kind of formulation is correct. I think it's, it's the proper understanding of the original conception of individual rights. It's part of what the First Amendment means. So the government can't come and break up your printing presses, right. but it also doesn't have to provide you with the printing yeah. press, and it doesn't have the power to force other people to provide you with right. the printing press, and it certainly can't make people listen to you. So in that sense, the right to free speech is the right as to freedom of action, to engage in the action of, speak, of speaking, of trying to win an audience, of right. putting up a poster, I'm giving a lecture, does anybody want to come? But you can't force people to come. Yeah. So that's that formulation is important, that what the right encompasses and what it doesn't. But if you think of it from a more social perspective, it can be, it can mean, and there's a way I would, and this piece, I think it means something like this, or at least you can read the piece as it means something like this, that the right to free speech, okay, you, you have, and let's take some of his examples. He thinks Peterson, Jordan Peterson, yeah is beyond the pale, like you, you, a real university would not have that. And right. that's revealing too, you said sort of all his examples. It would have Herbert Marcuse. He treats him as a legitimate thinker, even though he says, well, ominously, Marcuse, some of his uh, solutions are totalitarian. Oh yeah. No, but he wrote that, whole, Marcuse but, wrote a whole essay called Repressive Tolerance, where right. he called for um, suppressing the views essentially of anybody who believes in capitalism. I mean, that's a that's a slight oversimplification, but not much of an oversimplification. And a way to read the article is that that would be okay in a university. You would disagree with Mark yeah. Hughes and so, but Peterson not. Like right. you might think he's wrong, but he's so beyond the pale that he could not. And that's pretty interesting. That a totalitarian yeah. is that's okay. Yeah. But Jordan Peterson, no, that's yeah. beyond the pale. That's right. Um, and so it's, he would think, well, Jordan Peterson has a right to free speech in the sense that he could spew his nonsense, again, from the article's perspective. It's, it, it's nonsense and even evil. It's, so it's worse than nonsense. But does he have a right to an audience? And that means, or you can read it like, does society have to provide him with an audience? And the oh, answer yeah. there is no, because this would harm society. Why does society provide yeah. him with an artist when all he's going to do is harm society and its goals? And, right. and, and if you don't make a distinction between the private and the public mm -hmm. and private property and public institutions and so on, there's a way in which it's all, it's just society's resources. Yeah. And is society going to use its resources? Yes. To, and his answer is, no, I don't think society yeah. should use resources like this. And that's when you go to the formulations that you were calling like attention to, that the, the issue of agency, when he's talking about Mill or Peterson, it's clear who the agent is. Mill says this, Peterson says that. So this is to read a little more of what you wrote. So he says, uh, so of what you quoted before, he says, Instead, so I'm quoting, instead, I suggest that we could take a big step forward by distinguishing freedom, free speech from just access. And just here means justice. So proper, just access. Right. He quoted that, but then notice yeah. what's after that. Quote, access to the general public granted by institutions like television networks, newspapers, magazines, university lectures is a finite resource. Justice requires that, like any finite good, institutional access should be apportioned based on merit and on what benefits the community as a whole. 
close quote. <laughs> who's doing the apportioning? Yeah. And whose resources are they apportioning? Yeah. <laughs> and you could read the article as it's, well, it's the private institutions, and I'm, right. what I'm just recommending is a policy to private yeah. institutions that right. you can take seriously. Don't have people who are quacks. You're elevating them. You're giving them a standing they don't observe. So you gave the Woods uh, whole Oceanographic Institute as an example. And if you think of it as a, it's a private example, what he's telling them, if you've got a person who denies the theory of evolution, this is an oceanographic institute. It's about biology and so yeah. on. They're, he's denying, and for bad reasons, all these evolution yeah. deniers, he's denying for really bad reasons the central theory to the whole institution. Right. And if you allow that, you're yeah. undermining the very things that you're trying to achieve. So you could view it, and then that's a very positive thing. Like That's advice to a private institution about don't do this kind of right. thing. It actually undermines your mission. But if you take the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute as partly public, and this is what's so confusing about this, this aspect of the whole debate, because it's hard to figure out yeah. Is it private or is it public? And I looked on the website at their funding, and the first thing that listed in their funding is government funds and contracts. Yeah. And then it's private things. Oh, yeah. and so, on. so it's a blending of the it two. It definitely is, yeah. And from that perspective, then, there's different issues about, yep. it's not to say we should just have evolution deniers. Right. Just, but then it's an issue of, well, this is public funds in part and what, yeah. how should that be spent and why right. um, and it blurs that it, I think he's blurring that he takes examples that are clearly private I think like yep. A&P and said yeah they it's right if they think Roseanne is a racist and so on. it's right to cancel her show and this is what you the kind of thing these institutions should be doing if they take seriously their mission that they're about providing real values and truth that if you've got this uh, but then it, he has other universities, and universities, even ones that are nominally private, like he brings up Columbia and New York University, get so much funding from government that it's, it's hard. And what's interesting is he doesn't draw any attention to this yeah. issue, public or private. And it, it's hard to imagine he doesn't know that there's a, there's a distinction yeah. to be made here. Um, yeah, the way he states it is, so this is one of the things... Uh, that I didn't pick up the first time I read it. I focused on the one sentence that I quoted, but in the second read, I noticed the rest of this, and I focused more on it. And, the, and reading that, I mean, this, you could, I mean, you, this, this second sentence that you read, access, quote, access to the general public granted by institutions like television uh, networks, newspaper magazines, and universal access is a finite resource. Question, whose resource? And then continuing on, justice requires that, like any finite good, institutional access should be apportioned based on merit and what benefits the community as a whole. You could, you could easily, um, those two sentences could apply just as much to communist Russia and sort of taking it as, you know, it's a finite resource that's owned by the people and we have to apportion this to those that we think are good or bad or, or you know, are pro-party or anti-party, um, as you could apply it to a capitalist country in which all of these things are um, private owned, and he doesn't make that distinction at all. Um, and I have a hard time believing that he doesn't know that, that that distinction exists. So it's very much this idea that the resources are there, they just exist, blank out where they came from, the fact that they're owned by somebody, the fact that they had to be produced by somebody, and now it's our job just to apportion them, quote, apportion, or our mm -hmm. being society's job, which always means the government. Now, the concrete example, so I'll give, give a, what would, might be to a lot of uh, viewers and a lot of people out there, a counterintuitive example of exactly this kind of thing coming up not long ago in Congress, and what I'm talking about is the Mark Zuckerberg hearings. And you remember when Cruz, Ted Cruz, took him to task, um, and a lot of people took him to task for allegedly, uh, you know, quote, censoring conservative views, or at least 
you know, took him to task for, for what we could put it as restricting conservative views. Mm -hmm. It's still yeah. wrong for Congress to be criticizing or saying anything about that at all, in my view. Um, but even, I mean, even assuming that Facebook is doing that, and I'm not at all convinced they are doing it, um, but even assuming they're doing it, uh, I found one, one of the things I found odious about that is who the hell built this, this thing? And where do you, Ted Cruz, or anybody in Congress, get off telling Mark Zuckerberg how he should uh, manage a platform and a company that he built? He created this thing, and a lot of people working with him. You know, all very smart people, all working really hard to produce something that clearly Ted Cruz thinks is a value. And yet he, he doesn't ever mention the fact that this was Zuckerberg who created it and Facebook who maintains this, that this value all comes from them. And somehow it's theirs is to create and ours, meaning, you know, society and, and politicians like Ted Cruz is to dispose and to decide how these resources are used. That's utterly odious. And you cannot reconcile that with free speech. There's no way. It's as soon as government controls that, uh, free speech is, is dead. Yeah. And it, I mean, I have a very low opinion of Ted Cruz, but it went lower after yeah. this, oh. and considerably lower yeah. because what he actually had was a platform and sort of a national audience that what he could have said was, if you guys are doing some of this, that now you're trying to put in algorithms and AI to to restrict certain views that are now held to be odious. And you're not doing that because of your internal um, business practice and what you think is right and how the business should be run, but you're trying to avoid government yeah. regulation, government stepping in. If he, if Cruz had said, is, like, are you doing it because of this? And if you're doing it because of that, that's really wrong. But the solution right. to it is the government has to back off threatening you to hope that you do voluntarily right. what they will force you to do if you don't do it voluntarily. Yeah. He could have, so he could have exposed part of the forces at work, but instead it's just, it's as though Facebook is the evil yeah. um, entity here and the government is what we need to come in and tell yeah. it how to run, so to control it. And it's such, uh, as I said, I didn't find it surprising, but it is, it, I mean, it's, it, that was really disgusting to see. Yeah, yeah I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, so one question I wanted to ask you, um, and this isn't, I mean, you, you touched on it. Um, it's not, I guess, directly raised by the article, but it comes up a lot, which is um, really, I mean, I guess it's two questions. One is, what is the role of property rights in um or, or what's the connection between property rights and free speech? Um, and then secondly, and how do we deal with these kinds of naughty issues where the public and the private are being mixed together? Um, yeah. Yeah, say, say a few things about that because, I mean, I can ask you a few questions as you go, but. I mean, Ayn Rand stressed on the issue of property rights. She stressed, uh, and I think, correctly in, in a, this is very important that you all rights require property rights so rights are um, when we talk about the right to liberty property the pursuit of happiness they're aspects of a total they're not separable parts so you can't have a right to liberty which and under that is freedom of speech if you don't also have a right to property so they're right. aspects of a total you can distinguish them intellectually and in it's right but you can't distinguish them in actual practice. They have yeah. to exist together or neither exist. And, right. and so if you don't have control, to take the simple kind of example, if you don't have control of a printing press, you might have the right to print, uh, uh, to speak, have newspapers, but if you can't control the very means by which you would do that, or if you can't have a classroom, you can't have a microphone, you can't build a studio, that you can't don't have access to the internet that is you're not allowed to purchase it and the government will come and shut you down so that is all it's in interference with your property but it's right. directed at your ability to speak so every right to exercise it has a crucial material component right. which means your actions in the world and that's what property rights protect they say right. this is your property you get to decide how to use it 
Nobody can interfere, nobody can control, no one can prohibit you. So if you've got a printing press, you can print what you want. Uh, if you've got an internet site and you've paid for it and so on, you can write what you want and the government can't step in. But if it, if it, I mean, this is why Ayn Rand thought, for instance, the FCC, the, and you can think of it, well, all it's doing is controlling property. It's not, what does it have to do with ideas? But it controls property from the perspective of, well, this broadcaster, what he's broadcasting is not in the public interest, so we're going to limit that. And, so, and that's all the realm of ideas. And the, the two are intertwined, and it's impossible for right. them not to be intertwined. Yeah, and part of what I think people miss is the freedom of speech means the freedom not to speak, not to support views that you disagree with, um, not only not to support them intellectually or morally, right, by sanction, by saying they're good, but to withdraw material support to them as well. And if you don't have that right, you don't really have intellectual freedom. And part of the problem, or one of the big problems of, of, of ignoring the role of private property in this is that if you come to believe, as sort of Cruz did with Facebook, that Facebook is, is censoring people's speech, or that refusing a platform, let's just take a, a private college, refusing a platform to certain kinds of ideas, if that censorship, the government has an obligation to step in and stop it. And you have no right to use your own property, which means you don't ultimately have the right to free speech. So it, 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 do, it achieves exactly the opposite of what people purport to want it to achieve. Now, whether they really are being honest about this, I'm skeptical. I don't think that Cruz is, is you know, I, I think Cruz wants to control Facebook. Um, and I think a lot of other politicians do. I think all the politicians in that hearing did. So it's not just, you know, Republicans, right. certainly. It's, it's on both sides of the, the political divide. I don't think there's anybody in politics today that really gets this. Um, but that's the mistake. And, and people make it innocently sometimes. I, I think a lot of people who are criticizing what, what's happening on college, and even to some extent Facebook and, and social media, they're, they're making an innocent mistake. They don't get this connection. But they, they will end up, you know, handing free speech over to its adversaries if they don't make this crystal clear. Um, all right, so that's, so in the, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, and this is why the issue of threats and government threats is so important, because it's, it's part of the way that it blurs people's understanding. Uh, it's radically different if Facebook, that the action is the same. So let's let's just say for the sake of argument, Facebook is restricting certain yeah. posts based on content. It's radically different if they're doing that because the government is threatening that if you don't do this, we're going to impose controls versus Facebook's thinking for by its own internal operations, this content we don't think is good. Right. It should not have the visibility on, on our platform that it currently has, so we're right. going to restrict it. The one is an exercise of free speech, yes. and the other is a violation of Facebook's free speech. But because the threats are in the background, and the action not only is the same, they're just restricting certain things, people can think, well, they can treat those two things as the same, and they're radically different. Yeah, that's a really important point, because the, the, so my observation of what's happened with <clears throat> excuse me, social media particularly Facebook, a little bit YouTube, is that when they first started, let's say, screening content, and if you remember what, what, what instigated all that, what caused it was complaints by advertisers that their advertisements were, <laughs> were appearing on essentially white supremacist videos or racist, clearly racist videos. And so if I'm Toyota, you know, I don't want, like if you watch YouTube, and these things just pop up, and it's an algorithm that controls this. I'd be pretty pissed off if, yeah. my video, yeah. if my advertisement popped up on a Richard Spencer video. And so they complained to YouTube, and YouTube and all of social media now says, yeah, actually, this is a problem. We have yeah. to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard problem because so you have all kinds of different kinds of videos. They, they do all sorts of different things. So there's a big difference between a rap video on one hand and a Richard Spencer video, or a really racist mm -hmm. video on the other. Right. You can object to a rap video, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. And there are all kinds of advertisers that would be fine. My, I don't care if my, my uh, products are being advertised on a rap video that uses harsh language or whatever versus real you know, racism. So how they solve this is a difficult thing. And I'm very sympathetic to them, even if they're making mistakes, even if they're, you know, uh, I mean, Dave Rubin thinks that they're, they're 
essentially discriminating against him. And I think there's some truth to that. So I'm sympathetic to him. But at the same time, it's hard. It's hard to do yes. that. And, and if, if I can't figure out how to do it, I'm not going to second guess the people who, who yeah. can. Yeah. Um, but what, what we've moved from there, and I'll, I'll pause in a minute. To, but I mean, that was the first stage. And I think Facebook and all these guys were trying hard. Let's figure out how to deal with this. Since then, since the hearings, since all the Russian hacking scandal happened, all of the complaints about fake news, now I think a lot of what Facebook is doing has nothing to do with their own view of what they should be restricting with the political ads. I think it has everything to do with the public pressure and really it's the, it's the threat of regulation, not only direct regulation um, in the form of, say, campaign finance laws, but antitrust actions. Um, I really think they're not any longer operating on, the, on their own independent judgment. Yeah. And public pressure, again, is a, uh, I mean, if, it, if one tries to use it as a technical term, it's a package deal because yes. public pressure could mean people say and actually are quitting Facebook because of what they're doing right. versus they're clamoring for controls and regulations on yes. Facebook. And you could call that public pressure, but that's right. again the threat of force and that's a threat to violate Facebook's freedom of speech and YouTube's yes. freedom of speech versus, yes, it's perfect. If you think the way Facebook is operating or YouTube and if Dave Rubin, I mean, he's gone to some other platforms as well. He uses yeah. PayPal. Because if you don't like how it, and he will say right. this, like it's a private company and they can do what they want. I'm going somewhere else. And that, you can call that public pressure. Right. Saying, well, we're using a different platform. This is what you're going to do. Versus we're going to put the government on you and you can no longer use your own judgment. Those are, again, very different. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the naughty issue of what, um, how to think about, I guess, the mixture of public and private, or, or really fully public institutions. And I mean, Woods Hole is a good example, um, in part because they get government funding, but the, the quintessential example is the public university and how, how to think about um, free speech in that context. Um, so why don't you say a few words and I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I have my own views, but I'd rather hear what I you mean, I think the, the, the First and most important point is that public institutions like a research institution uh, or a university are inherently in conflict with freedom of speech. Yeah. That's the most important point to get, that freedom of speech, and it goes back to what we were talking about, in terms of freedom of speech is intertwined with the right to private property. So it is a violation of your freedom of speech yeah. if you're made to fund something with which you disagree. Yeah. And this was grasped at the time of the founding in regard to religion. It's yeah. part of why the First Amendment, it's both, you can't, in, the government can't interfere with the free exercise, but it also can't establish, which means fund and elevate to a, a, a standing that other churches and, and religious institutions would not have because we're pouring public money into this one, whether it's the Anglican church, it doesn't matter what, it, it, that's a violation of people's religious freedom. And the wider point is that if you do that in the realm of ideas, if you prop up a university and say, this is a state university, we're pouring funds into it, you're propping up one institution that conveys ideas and you're using money from other people who might go to other institutions and who might disagree with what this institution is doing and what it's doing in the realm of ideas, and you're making people fund it. That's a violation, not here of their religious freedom, but as we would put it, of their intellectual freedom, but that includes their freedom of speech. You're making them pay for the expression of ideas with which they disagree. Right. And if you take freedom of speech seriously, part of taking it seriously is it's a moral responsibility to support the things that you agree with and not support the things right. that you disagree with. And right. if you take that freedom away from people, they can't do what they they have a moral responsibility to do. So that's the, so the, the, the context, this fundamental context, I think is crucial. You can't think about this issue. If you don't grasp, they're an inherent and irreconcilable conflict. Right. But having said that, if there's going to be public institutions, I think you have to take seriously that they're established for a reason, and that reason is spelled out in some kind of way, 
and that sets some guidelines for how they should operate, and you put people in charge of these institutions, and they have to oversee the basic direction of the institution. So if you have to take the Woods Hole uh, Institute, it's an oceanographic institute, presumably it has a mission about studying the oceans and maintaining their, their uh, <clears throat> sort of viability long term, or I don't know exactly what all their research is involved in. And that sets certain kinds of boundaries for what is legitimate for this institution to be doing and what it's illegitimate for it to be doing. And I think, I mean, the, the evolution deniers are, um, they masquerade as scientific. I mean, some will, I would just say it's, well, it's based on the Bible and a literal, re but some will try to dress it up as we've got arguments against evolution. None of these arguments are good. I mean, the, the inte so-called intelligent design, which is a dressed up version of the creationism. Yeah. That's, it's that kind of thing. And an institution that's dedicated to scientific research, even if it's public, if it's, if it's the people who are in charge of it say, like, this is way beyond the pale of what science is. And so this is not scientific research. This is not the employment of the scientific method and so on. They have to say, um, but they're sorry, you're, you can't work here. I mean, otherwise, how could they function if yeah, they can't do that? Right. But in do it's, Nevertheless, true that in doing that, it is a violation of people's intellectual freedom. Because the people who think, no, but you don't really understand science and so on, they have to find this. Yes. Um, but if there are such things, they have to be able to operate. And the people running them have to, they can't, it can't be, we have no opinion about it. We don't know what science is. We don't know what it means to study. We don't even know if there's oceans. So if you're an ocean denier, yeah, yeah come and work here at the Oceanographic Institute. It can't be like that. Right. But what, so let's take an example of, um, uh, so let's take Berkeley, because it's the center of a lot of these conflicts. You see Berkeley, um, and, I, and I know a bit about it because I did a talk at Ocon about it. And so you had both, in the 1960s, you had this thing called the free speech movement, which was anything but a free speech movement. It was really a mass civil disobedience movement. Um, around a ban on political activity on campus. And then in 2017, we had, there were a number of incidents at Berkeley, Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, there was a riot over Milo speaking there. And then later on, the, the university, I think out of legitimate concerns about security, had uh, issues with allowing Ben Shapiro to speak there. And there was a big flap about that. Um, starting with the latter example, I don't, it doesn't seem right to me to say I mean, I think it's just wrong to say Shapiro has a right to speak at UC Berkeley and that if he's not allowed to speak, it's a violation of his. It can't be right to say he has a right to use even public resources. It makes, I mean, it, it, you know, it, as you put it, it there's an intractable uh, conflict between his rights. He actually lives in California. He's a taxpayer in California. So he's funding a school that won't allow him to speak there or that he disagrees with. But then again, there are tons of other taxpayers in, in California that don't want Shapiro to speak. And then you have the administration that has to make sense of all of this stuff. It strikes me as incoherent to talk about a right for anybody to speak on a university campus, because we do, it just does, you know, it, it, it does damage to the whole idea of a right. A right means you are entitled to do this by virtue of the fact that you're, you exist as a human being. You're entitled to take certain actions. So it can't be a right. Um, and I always object when people talk about that as a right. Um, so I guess, I mean, I gather, because you're nodding, you, you agree with me, but part of what I also want uh, your thoughts on is, how does a university deal with this, or these kinds of conflicts, or is there, um, are there really any principles by which a university can deal with these kinds of conflicts? Um, I mean, I think there are some that, the and, and part of it is that these, um, state or quasi-state universities, they do articulate um, sort of guidelines for yeah. how they function. And there is a real issue of do they live up to those guidelines and do they um, apply them consistently right. and impartially? In the, and impartially here means in the sense that all the students, once they're enrolled in the university, and the faculty as well, that they have the same standing so that it's not um, 
we say that we're, we want vigorous debate, and so we want students to bring speakers to campus and so on. But this one group, we don't like anything they right. do. So you're not, you could, I mean, that's just, it's, it's an obvious bias where they're not yeah. living up to their, and I think the student who's at that university or a faculty member has a legitimate grounds of complaint that you say, this is how the guidelines are. This is how it operates for other people. And this is why, like this example of Marcuse versus Peterson. If Marcuse is acceptable, Peterson is acceptable. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and one has a real gripe or grievance if it's, oh no, you can't bring Peterson to campus, but if Marcuse was still alive, oh yeah, we'd love him and we'd give him an honorary degree and so right. on. That there's issues there yeah. um, in regard to that. But I think it's right what you said at the outset. It's not an issue about the right of a citizen to speak there. It's more, the issue is that insofar as there's um, these kinds of public property and institutions, they have to be run in as legitimate a way of, as right. possible and as transparent, I think, yes. as well as right. possible. Because everybody's paying for this, it should be crystal clear to everybody, this is how it's working, this is how they make the decision, this is why they make the decisions, um, and one's, one's um, if you don't like how the public universities in your state are operating, you have recourse yeah. to that. You can change who you vote for, um, and in, I mean, school districts and so on, there's people who sit on the boards of various things that, so you have that kind of input, you can say, or that kind of say as a citizen, as a voter. And insofar as they're public, that's the kind of control that people have. But it's not, a, it's, so you have a right to vote. Right. But you don't have a right to speak on the campus right. if it really is against the policies. Um, yeah. Yeah, I take it the same basic approach would apply to public spaces like parks, let's say, and the kinds of places that, for better or worse, the government allocates for, you know, public gatherings and, and, and public speech, like the National Mall, you could think of as a good example of that. And many towns have spaces that they, that they regularly allow people to speak on. Um, and that, yeah, there's no right to speak there. There can't be a right to speak there. And then further, if we think about it in the context of like Charlottesville and a lot of these violent protests, there have to be rules of civilized behavior. There has to be uh, a distinction made between, certainly between the use of force and speech, but as, I mean, you've said this many times to me, action and speech. So if you get a, if you get, you know, a bunch of, it doesn't really matter who they are, but in Charlottesville, it was the white supremacists or the white nationalists showing up with football, you know, helmets and, and baseball bats. Um, and then they surround the statue and they're marching through the town. And then there's a counter protest by Antifa. That's not speech anymore. Right. And even the marching, even the marching aspect of it. So you could take a, a tamer example is Berkeley in the sixties. That was, it was no, I don't know it was anywhere near the kind of, certainly not the violence that we saw at Charlottesville. But still, if you see the pictures of it, and I'll refer people, ultimately my talk will come out hopefully on video and people can watch it, but if you look at the pictures of Berkeley, uh -huh. you know, it's students dressed in ties and everything, but it's clearly, it's, it's mass civil disobedience, and Ayn Rand talked about this, surrounding the cop car, you know, uh, essentially telling the university, if you don't accede to our demands, we're going to occupy the entire campus and we're going to shut down the campus. That is not speech. That is intimidation. That is lawlessness. That's kind of a threat. It's not an effort to talk to somebody. It's an effort to bully them into submission. And I think the you could argue a little bit about the National Mall, so we could come back to that. But it's again, if, if one thinks about public institutions and public property, they're instituted for a reason, which delimits their function. So, and this is a point Ayn Rand made about, um, the, the Skokie March, that you don't have a right to clog up the streets. The streets, now, I don't think in the end, streets should be public property, but if they're public property, which they are now, they're for people to get from point A to point B, not to gather so you can prevent other people from getting to point A to point B. 
So the minute that happens, and it, it's not an issue of the content of what yeah. their placards are. If they had no placards, if they had no viewpoints, it's just yeah. we're going to camp out here for the next week because it's nice out here and uh, we want some camping. The, yeah. you, the police should remove them and not. And it's not well. This is public property, so I have a right to be here just yeah. like anybody else. No, you have a right to drive your car from point A to point B on this road. You don't have a right to put up your tent on this road um, or to march on it. And so, and that's, I think, so you brought up parks, but it's the same. Like, why are there parks? Well, we need green space for people to relax, walk their dog. It's, it's again, not to have a mass gathering of 5,000 people pr protesting something. Go rent a stadium if that's what right. you want to do and have a rally. And yeah. you can do that on private property. The public property is not created in order to do that. And that sets the limitations on how it should be used. Now, the, and that's why I say something like the National Mall, if you view it as part of its purpose is to allow people to petition the government, yeah. then that's a different, but it's a, it's a very distinct, it's like that's not a normal public park. Right. Um, that's a distinctive thing. And then there's, I think, distinctive things that would apply to it about how it should be governed. And, so, um, and it's again, it's, it's, um, it can't be done fully consistently, but it's, right. that doesn't mean it can't be done better or worse. Yeah. No. And I think, I mean, my sense is they do a reasonably good job at the National Ball, but leaving aside whether that is that kind of space, I'm not sure it is, it's kind of de facto become that sort yeah, of space. Right. But there are definitely examples through history. I mean, you think back to the founders times, and anybody ever goes to Williamsburg, um, Virginia, Colonial Williamsburg, and then there's the there's literally a square like right in front of I don't know if it's the courthouse or town hall, and they have the people come out and debate like the mock-ups of what used to happen way back in the day, and it was really that was the idea. Is that's part of where you are speaking to citizens mm -hmm. and speaking to your government, yeah. um, and in effect petitioning or or having a public gathering right. that you might liken today to the news media or other ways that people engage in mass communication. But that was an intentional sort of set aside. Um, not that yeah, I, I, I yeah. We both agree that that's not a proper role for government. But you mentioned um, stadiums. It's worth noting. Um, I've done a little bit of uh, study of the history of the right of association and mass movements. One of the really interesting things you see is that um, prior to the 20th century, a whole lot of movements and the suffragette movement. Uh, the women's suffrage movement is, is an example of this, although it's mixed, they tended to rent out their own private halls to do this stuff. Yeah. And it's fascinating the, the frequency like with which they did this. It was almost assumed that's what, that one gets the sense. I haven't studied enough to say this definitively, but there was this kind of assumption, it seemed, yeah, we, if we're going to speak to people, we need to rent out and pay for the space, and then we invite people, and then we have our gathering, and we don't clog up the streets. That's not what the streets are for. The government doesn't have an obligation to present us with, you know, a forum. That, I think, changed very much during the civil rights period and then during the, the sort of 60s protest period. It was, it was really ingrained in people's minds that if you, don't, if you can't speak out on a public space, somehow free speech dies. I don't think that's true at all in part because you, you've convinced me of it, but uh, talking to you and thinking more about this, it hit me that, yeah, this is definitely just not the case. And I think you've made the point that there's an, and I've, I've said this publicly too, that when government provides these spaces, it's tantamount to government subsidized speech and government should not be doing that. It shouldn't be paying for people's political views or their, you know, and it shouldn't be providing, um, spaces for people to speak because that that it's the same thing as subsidizing people's speech and it's it's there's no way you can reconcile that with free speech and intellectual freedom yeah so and and the the civil rights case is a mixed case um and i think it's important that it's a mixed case and people can't sort of separate out the elements right. of the mixture because in that case, it was massive government discrimination yeah. against black. So it wasn't just that um, there's some private institution that separates, uh, doesn't allow, let's just say it doesn't allow blacks in at all, not just separates them in terms of where they can sit and so on. Um, I think a private institution in a certain context has the right to do that. 
But the context in for the civil rights is this is all backed by the government. Um, and so they have a real profound uh, grievance with the government. Yeah. And then there's a question of how do you petition the government? And, and if they have demonstrations outside of city hall saying, we can't register to vote, right. we've got all these onerous requirements yeah. that we can't meet and so on. I have a lot of sympathy that you yeah. go, that not just rent out private things and yeah. you go to the government building and say, we want to vote. These are people who want to vote. They're obviously of legal voting age and they can't get registered to vote. Right. But it, there's the blurring of that along with grievances against private institutions. And so yeah. on. But the private institutions, they were able to operate under the cover of public law that was discriminatory. Yes. And so so yes. it's a complex case and you yeah. can't, I have some sympathy for it, even though I don't always agree with the methods. Right. Um, there's a massive injustice that's different than what is going on now. Yeah, a state-sponsored injustice. Yeah. And it's... And I've always, or not all of us, but I've come to think of what was happening in the South. I mean, this is pretty much the entire history of the South up until, I don't know, the 1960s, certainly. Um, as it's very difficult to separate out the public from the private. And this was, frankly, if you look at legal history, it was a very difficult issue for the government to deal with, the federal government. And how do you protect individuals in this situation? even after slavery, you know, even after the Civil War, um, when the, you know, before it was, it was the local, you know, police that was, that was essentially oppressing these people. Um, and now all they do is they take their uniform off, but everybody knows that it's still the cop. There's such a, a mixing of, of public and private behavior. It was a really difficult issue to solve. Yeah. So yeah, that is a special case that you can't yeah. analyze that outside of the context of understanding that this was what, for the entire country's entire history up until the 60s and 70s, this was state-sponsored subjugation and, and racism. And yeah. yeah. That and that's, important. again, I mean, a similarity to the present is the issue of threats. I, I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, th th the threat of force is the use of force, and it's a particularly pernicious use because it seems like there's not force, and yet the whole um, situation you can't understand other than understanding that one person is being for forced. So that's the Zuckerberg kind of Facebook kind of example here. It's if they're, and they certainly are, but if they're being uh, intimidated by the government saying, if you don't do A, B, and C, we're going to issue laws right. to make you, that's a threat. And you have to understand their behavior as it's coerced. It's not voluntary, even though it might look like it's voluntary. And it's similar in, in the case of the civil rights and of blacks in America after slavery. If the government is not going to protect their rights, so yes. when there's gangs of whites coming and say, if you open this store, we're smashing in the windows. And so we haven't done anything yet, so what's the big deal? But that's the threat of force. Right. And if the person doesn't, can't legitimately think, no, I'm going to open my business and I'm going to go to the police if this happens. Yeah. If he thinks well, the police won't care or they're going to be on the side of the, the gang that's terrorizing him, he won't open the store in the for first place. Right. And then you might think, well, but where was the force? But it was yeah. the threat of force. Yeah. And they were under constant threat because yeah. their rights weren't upheld. Um, and that's a, it's a very different context uh, when you're, when the threat of force is widespread, you have to think of people's actions in that, that that's what's yeah. going on. And it's not all voluntary, even if yep. it might look like it's voluntary. So that raises one question. I don't want to go too long, but you keep raising interesting points that lead to other points. So let me just ask you one more question. Do you think, and I, I'm not analogizing here to the civil rights movement so much, but you talked about government not protecting people from the threat of force, even if it's the threat of private force. This is obviously problematic. But the question is, is this a free speech issue? So that the, the obvious current example is, uh, is Islamic totalitarians and their actual attacks on people worldwide. So Salman Rushdie, Theo Van Gogh, Danish cartoons, and then threats to certain people here in the US, South Park people, um, the Garland shooting and others. Do, would you call that, uh, or what would you, would, is that an example of de facto censorship, let's say, um, when government is not protecting people 
and then they're, they're essentially doing what people typically refer, refer to as self-censorship. But I think it's probably not a good thing to call it self-censorship because that obscures the fact that it's actually government that's the source of this, whether it's, right. yeah. you know, government can, can censor directly and allow a kind of de facto censorship indirectly but not taking the actions it's supposed to take. Yeah, it's like you can use the term self-censorship, but yes, only in that wider context. Yeah. That it, the de facto is the government is censoring by allowing people, party A to threaten party B if they voice some views and not stepping in and saying, no, that that is illegal and, and we're going to uphold the right of free speech of this party A and these threats are, we're taking them seriously, we're investigating them, and we're going to go after these people. And it didn't happen with Rushdie. Uh, it didn't happen with the Danish cartoons. And it doesn't happen still now. I mean, you brought Garland and so on. There's not the, if the government made clear that uh, you can voice these views and we're going to protect you, um, it's a very different situation where versus people thinking, like, is the government going to do anything if we start getting threats? That they're going to burn down our printing presses and right. vandalize and kill us, slit our throats. I mean, they all get these kinds of threats. And again, right. the, the threats are force, and they should yeah. be treated very, very seriously. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we probably taken up enough time on this, um, although... This was really great, Ankar. I appreciate you, you doing this. Mm -hmm. Let me just remind readers that the article we had, that we discussed earlier that kicked off this, The Ignorant Do Not Have a Right to an Audience. It's New York Times, published June 25th, 2018 by Brian Van Norden. You can probably find it in a Google search, but we'll put a, a link to it. Um, but obviously, we talked about a whole lot more, um, all of which is important to this issue. Um, so uh, thanks a lot for, for doing this. Sure, thanks. All right.